Newcomers, there, there's coffee over there. There are some chairs on this side. Um, so, uh, actually, it's kind of interesting. We did a couple of little housing things here a long time ago, and uh, when things were just, people were just starting to feel pinches, and we had a couple of kind of conversations about it. Obviously, things have uh, come to uh, uh, be more organized, and we've got the heavyweights in the county involved. We've got Nels Nils and John Hillick involved in <laughs> I read the papers, John. <laughs> but anyway, so I, I, I think I've dithered enough here. And uh, uh, I'll just say that because you know, uh, you all know Nils, so I'm going to tell you something about Nils that you may, might not know, that I can't figure out. I can't figure out, you got to be Norwegian, because how one guy can play soccer and rugby. I don't know. If you were in England, you'd have to make a choice, right? But it's, I guess in Norway, it's Virginia, it's all right. And Nels, what you don't know about Nels, he, you might not know him. He's got an Oregon reputation for building and cycle Oregon and that kind of stuff. But he has an international reputation as a llama packer in Halfway, <laughs> which he's been doing for... I don't know, 30 years or something. Years, yeah. So anyway, I'll turn it over to the to the crew. Enjoy. All right. Thanks. And those you people online, you can't you, you watch, enjoy, and you're going to have to send in your questions later. But we'll have time for you and the audience here to interact. Thanks. Uh, this is great. This is kind of our first uh, public. Uh, public appearance as, as Will Our Resources talks about our, our newest venture uh, in workforce housing that was encouraged by our board. Um, and we've got, I think, two of our board members here, Larry Gall and Brad Stevens. And we've got uh, a couple advisory board members, Nels Cavern and Eileen, uh, and quite a few staff. So it's nice to be here with all of you today. Um, and you know, in 1996, when Willow Resources was started by a whole bunch of people in the community, um, the priority was putting people back to work. We had uh, unemployment um, that was up uh, during the winter, close to um, well over 20 percent, um, and, um, and and you know, just a lot of uh, cascading negative impacts from the loss of the mills here. And, uh, and today, uh, the situation is a little bit different when we think about um, the condition of our communities and the opportunities in front of us. Um, housing is, is a bigger challenge right now. And uh, housing is a challenge for people that live here, and it's a challenge in terms of uh, the community services and economic development opportunities that are in front of us today. So uh, last year, the board uh, asked the staff, all of us, whether we had the bandwidth to tackle some, another challenge. <laughs> and, uh, and we're taking a shot at it. And we're taking a shot at it with the support of uh, a number of partners and, and an advisory board that was created to bring some additional capacity. Um, and we'll walk through all of that, walk through some of our thinking about um, the challenge we're doing and how we're responding to that. And, I th and one part of this is just to recognize that <coughs> we see ourselves as one contributor. Uh, the cities and the counties are already working on this. The state and the federal government has a lot of programs working on that. There's a lot of people in the private sector, uh, in our communities that are working on this. This is a, this is another community effort that we, we all need to, uh, to do our part and, and help solve. So, do you want to offer anything else, or should we just get started? I, I would just uh, echo what Nils just said, that uh, this is a complex, difficult problem here, and uh, needs to be involved. Every organization, all, at all, all perspectives are going to be really important <coughs> to, to solve or contribute. 
contribute to the solution to this problem. And so uh, we're taking this step at it from our perspective, um, but it's really, really important for everybody here and, uh, to understand that it's it, it's really got to be a community-wide effort. It's a community-wide problem, and it's uh, not just this county's problem, obviously. It's a nationwide problem. It's a tough problem. So uh, I just want to echo that because uh, we're, we're we're taking a stab at it here, and we, everybody's going to need to help uh, and contribute to make it possible. This one's for you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've got to add too much about the housing shortage. I think that everybody has experience in, in this community, uh, uh, one way or another. Heard about people without adequate housing or people in substandard housing or people not being able to find any housing at all. We've heard from employers talk about uh, no place for people to live. They want to come and work here. I think I think everybody has a story that they can share uh, about about what they uh, what they've experienced. Uh, you know, the, the one of the issues here that we're trying to focus on is that middle level housing. Uh, we call it workforce housing in this presentation, but it's for people who are living and working here in the county. Uh, traditionally, there has been a lot of support from the governmental side for uh, lower income or affordable housing, it's called. Uh, and then, of course, at the other end, there's no need for that kind of support. But the middle uh, uh, is a new phenomena for uh, all levels of government and all levels of funding. Uh, so. We're talking about that middle slice of workforce housing in this effort. Uh, there are lots of other good efforts around uh, uh, the other needs. This is a somewhat new challenge for rural uh, areas, but it's a new challenge everywhere in the country. And we'll show you, I'll show you a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, and where we experience this most directly is labor shortage. Uh, the reason we care about that, it's, you know, that shortage is, has an impact on economic development. Lots of healthcare and community services are struggling to find <coughs> adequate, appropriate housing for people. Uh, and uh, local government, uh, uh, law enforcement, and other services. And so this becomes a more and more urgent challenge uh, as, as we have fewer and fewer people here to help us meet the needs of the community. So housing has a pervasive impact on everybody. How did this happen? The, the real question is, how did I get two slides in a row? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what this title means. <laughs> Look who's got the little clicker thing. Uh, how did this happen? And this is not unique. Uh, in some ways, to, to our county, you know, there's a lack of investment. Uh, there's a lack of builder capacity. If we say we're going to build 100 homes tomorrow, we had the financing for it, we had the land for it, we had everything in place for it. We don't have that capacity here to do that. Everybody knows how difficult it is to find uh, people to to do work, to build, and so on and so forth. And so, uh, we have a capacity problem there. Uh, Land use and zoning constraints, we could talk a lot about that, but we're in the middle of a, of a huge transition in the state and in the country around rethinking uh, land, uh, land use zoning constraints, lot sizes, densities, uh, configurations. Uh, so uh, that's, a, that's one of the areas where this becomes a really <coughs> Tangled knot to un untangle because uh, communities have appropriate biases about what they want <coughs> their communities to look like, what density is appropriate, uh, how large lots should be, and and uh, changing those uh, those requirements and those regulations are important. But the good news is there's a lot of work going on in the county to think about that. And, and begin to formulate some responses to the challenges that are created by our current 
zoning constraints. The market dynamics here in, in this community, uh, we have to mention is the fact that, you know, second home and vacation homes uh, are getting a lot of investment. Uh, lots of building going on there in a way that takes away that capacity for doing the work that I was talking about just a minute ago because people are building second homes or vacation rentals and that and and our building resources focused on that. The lending resources focused on that. Uh, so it's not just mm -hmm. capability in terms of uh, talent to build, but it's also the funding in infrastructure. There's money for nice uh, higher end homes. This is a really interesting uh, number right here. Uh, in a sense, what was the date on this when we did it yesterday? You know, okay. I can just go to that. Yeah, let, uh, yeah let's look at this. Uh, so this is 2002 for people who can't see it and it goes through to 2023. And uh, houses less than 200,000 represented 92.5% of new single family house sales in 2002. And this and last year or this year uh, through January, they were down to 4.8%. And then this is houses um, priced higher than $500,000 in 2002, they were 7.5% of sales. Now they're 95.2% uh, of sales. So that's nationwide. So again, just to put our challenge in that context, it's not unique to Malawi County. This is happening across the country. Mills, what does that graph look like if you adjust for inflation? <laughs> Right now we're in another transition where you know Joseph's beginning their planning commission. People are starting to uh, well starting is not the right word, really begin to look at inventory of available land and think about these things. Uh, uh, and, and so all of that takes time and work. Uh, good job, there's a lot of efforts underway right now. Again, go back to my earlier comments that we've all got to work on this together. But we, we, we can't overlook the fact that it's tough to keep up with that, the changing environment represented in that graph and all the implications for zoning, funding, uh, and so on. So. Uh, and I just add, um, through, through some of the other uh, partnerships and, and services that I'm involved in, in, including the USDA Equity Commission, their Rural Community and Economic Development Subcommittee, this issue has been talked a lot across the country in that for the better part of you know, the last hundred years, Rural places, agrarian places, have seen a slow but steady decline in population. And so they haven't faced a housing shortage or a land use planning challenge, and they haven't maintained those skill sets, those capacities to be thinking creatively about solving a, a constraint, a new challenge. And so we've got to rebuild those skills, those capacities, in the individual capacity, but also the teamwork to solve a, a different problem that many rural places haven't had to have to deal with in a long time. So um, there's a variety of things that um, that we all need to be working on, and some of them are already being done. So this is we're not presenting anything particularly new here, but these are all important, and we want to emphasize that um, the housing needs assessment, so we have a better sense of what we actually need to do here, what is the what is the gap, and, and, and what are the types of homes, styles of homes, prices of homes that'll help meet that, meet that gap, what does affordability look like in Wallowa County, so that it's really grounded in the economics of our community. And the City of Enterprise is, made, is nearing completion on that. Um, what, what we've collectively been talking about with the county and the other cities and, the, and Oregon's DLCD is trying to complete one for the whole county. So we have a full countywide picture of that. 
and then the review of um, land use, planning, zoning, building codes, again, the county and, and the state are doing a lot of work there to create more flexibility for different types of solutions. Uh, different land divisions, the, including the, um, the potential to place uh, auxiliary dwelling units, small homes adjacent to existing homes, etc. cetera. Um, and, and then looking at new ownership models, that's one of the areas that our new nonprofit, Working Homes LLC, can help play a role. So one of the types of ownership models is around <coughs> community land trusts, where a nonprofit can own the land and then make available a home for purchase, but you wouldn't be buying the land, right? You would only be buying the home with a long-term lease to that land that's basically guaranteed as long as you're taking care of the home. Um, one, one aspect of that, of that model is a cap on equity growth uh, as a possibility, so that there might be a limit on equity growth if someone can't sort of get a, run, a big run up in equity because of what's happening in the market for people coming into the community, maybe you limit it to well, making up a number, 3%, so that if you sell it in five years, you can still uh, enjoy some equity, but it's not an investment, it's a home. And, and it keeps that home at an affordable price for as long as this system is running, right? And ideally in perpetuity, that you're keeping this housing stock, which should have a lifespan of 100 years or more if we build it well, affordable through its own <coughs> lifespan. There's another ownership model that I'm going to mention it that, uh, that's an interesting model where local employers come together and uh, maybe we'll take this parcel of 21 acres that we're going to talk about in a minute and create a lot and a, and a local employer might uh, fund the housing <coughs> on that lot for their employees. Uh, it's another ownership model uh, that's getting some traction to really meet the need of, of providing the right housing for, uh, for employees that are needed in the community. Could I ask a question? Sure. So would the house for the new ownership model, would it, you be able to hand that down to mm -hmm. your kids, their kids? Yeah, yeah. You, you would have title to the house. Yeah, to you, the house, you, but yeah, not the land. But not the land, right. right. And that's just one ownership model that we're kicking around. There's a ton of possibilities out there that are worth evaluating, uh, and it's not just an issue of sort of uh, evaluating them for the mo their own sake, but uh, evaluating them for funding possibilities and market acceptance in, in, a, in a community. Uh, so there's a bunch of dimensions to that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a really important part of this discussion because ownership, if you look back at that graph, you know, uh, is getting out of reach for a lot of younger people. Right. Yeah. So, so how do we how do we address that as well? But the old company owned houses, people, you know, they didn't. This would be a better model than that, right? Because well, people so. really <laughs> lost money there. Right. You know, yeah, they had to like work for the company. They had to ha pay for the house that they priced. And the company kind of owned. Uh, it's probably a, uh, a misstatement on my part. The company funded. Oh, that's what I was trying to say, <laughs> which is means... I'm thinking of the old company. Yeah, you're thinking yeah. of the old towns. Yeah. yeah. But, but now this is, a, this is a mechanism to bring resources, financial resources, to build something uh, so people, so the price for that, that house might be lower because of the investment of the new building. Nice. Or the long-term debt or the grant or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. One of the things too, when we when the board asked us to start exploring this, we met with um, the county and, and some people from the cities, but also existing developers uh, and um, and people that were working in the affordable housing space. They all confirmed the need for something new and different to hit this missing middle between affordable housing and and the larger higher end homes that were already being built. And, and the developers said to us over and over, and obviously some developers might have different math, but the message we were getting was the math isn't, you know, if we're trying to aim for a, a, a home price between two hundred and $300,000 that's meeting, you know, certain size criteria and efficiency criteria, that's really hard to do just purely in, on, in the private market mechanism. 
And so taking advantage of some of the federal and state programs and, and other uh, sources of funding that a nonprofit entity can take advantage of is gonna be critical to solving that affordability question. So that's sort of what we're getting at there with the public-private partnerships. There's obviously, as we talked about before, with uh, builder capacity and, and development capacity, the new entity will eventually have staff that will be able to lead um, project development efforts and bring additional capacity to that. But it, it, at the end of the day, as we said at the beginning, right, we've all got to figure out how to work on this together and, and solve this mm -hmm. together. So our, uh, in, um, in December, the board made their final votes to incorporate uh, Working Homes LLC. So it was officially registered with the state of Oregon somewhere around the holidays or the beginning of the year. I don't remember the date, but it is now an official entity. Uh, it is wholly owned by Willow Resources for the purpose of continuing to advance our mission and purpose, supporting economic vitality in Willow County and in this case, specifically through investments in workforce housing that is accessible and affordable for the current and future workforce of Willow County. Um, at, it, uh, right now, as we have it set up as the ED Executive Director of Willow Resources, I've become the Managing Director of this new wholly owned subsidiary. Uh, we've got an advisory board that includes Nels Gabbard, Sarah Miller from Northeast Oregon Economic Development Department, Kaya DeMello, who's on the Law Resources Board, but he also works for Chrisman Development, and Katie Nesbitt, who is Willow County's Natural Resource and Economic Development Director. And then Jeff Petrillo, who's sitting over here, has been a very important uh, financial advisor to us. Uh, he has a long history of working in affordable housing and workforce housing across Oregon. I think most recently with the Network for Oregon Affordable Housing. Um, and we're really excited to have him as part of our team. We are raising money to hire a manager for this position and hope to have staff in place by the summer. If you can find a house for him. <laughs> <laughs> correct. That is 100% correct. <laughs> Um, you want to talk about this? Yeah. Okay. So, so you're going to hear about two different kinds of projects today. One's this 21-acre parcel that's here in Joseph, uh, and then the next one is an existing building. Uh, and and uh, what you have here is a picture of the architects who we've we've chosen to help us think this through and, and think help the community think it through by doing a conceptual plan. Uh, but I just want to mention before we get too deep into this, that these are two different kinds of projects. The partial of land is going to take three to five years. It's going to be <coughs> slow. It's going, uh, by comparison to the second project, uh, it's going to probably involve uh, slicing and dicing that 21 acres into a variety of different kinds of lots, some which might have high density, some which might have traditional homes. We don't really know yet. That's what this conceptual process is focused on. The other is an existing building, and our motivation there uh, was to uh, retain housing stock that's currently uh, meeting the kinds of objectives that we had. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's, it's a, an effort to preserve existing housing rather than see it go to short-term uh, housing for one sort or another. And so, uh, so it's not a big building or design project. It's a, it's, it's, it's a more immediate thing. But we felt like it was important to, uh, to have both of those things uh, as we came out of the box. Mm -hmm. If you could envision a box. Mm -hmm. and, we're gonna, and we're gonna talk about both of them. And we'll start with the vacant lot. And just so people know, it is, it is within the Joseph City limits, the northeast corner. So uh, between the new development, um, that Jeannie Story has been developing with, with a variety of private partners and then what is known as Meadowbrook Estates. Um, but it is within the, the northeast corner of the city limits, it's zoned R2. And we have, uh, we have through this calendar year, 
to explore that opportunity to acquire and develop that uh, 21 acre parcel. That's what the current owners have given us, um, that latitude. So as you know, it's, it's, a, it's just vacant ground, but so really the next step is a planning process with Spot Edwards Architecture. Uh, out of Portland, we solicited uh, proposals from four different firms uh, and, and uh, ultimately decided that this was the best fit for what we wanted to do. And so they will help us come up with a conceptual sort of plan for the entire 21 acres. And, and then the second phase, the third phase, I guess, would be to actually start thinking about specific designs for specific buildings and that sort of thing. But the initial effort by this firm over the, between now and the end of the year is to, is to build that uh, concept and flesh it out in, in a variety of meetings with the community to really make sure we're, we're going in the right direction. And so they would address things like uh, walkways into town, uh, how traffic would be handled, uh, uh, what amenities might be offered, uh, uh, playgrounds for kids, who knows what, uh, and, and, and at the same time do that art, uh, engineering work associated with infrastructure, uh, geotech, uh, um, uh, that sort of thing, drainage, all those kinds of issues uh, on the site. Where we are with them is that we, uh, we just uh, let them know we selected them, and uh, I think they, the plan is for them to start mid-month. Uh, uh, and, and we will be uh, uh, starting with a series of community meetings with them that you're all going to hear about and be welcome to be involved with. Uh, this, is, this is some of the work that they've done. Uh, I, think, I think it's fair to say that community involvement was a key part of our decision-making process. Uh, we really wanted to work with people who uh, have, have good tools and good sensibilities for working with a, uh, a diverse community. And so uh, that's really what they uh, bring to the table. For me. And they've done a lot of this kind of, as you can see, uh, <coughs> projects of this, this size. But we're not envisioning that there's somehow they're going to come up with a plan and then we're going to build it all out. Uh, what we're looking for is a plan to help us understand massing, uh, location of things, and then we're going to we're going to sort of tackle uh, that earlier comment I made about different lots, different sizes, different locations. But we're not envisioning. Maybe you are. But we're not, <laughs> we're not envisioning coming in and building out 21 acres and being done uh, right away. It's, it's going to be a slow process. In that. If it's in city limits, is it going to be hooked up to the city, like septic and water? And, okay. Yeah. 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 Hey, Quentin, um, as you're talking, are you going to have any sort of like a, a green building uh, standards to have environmentally uh, conscious? Housing or anything like that. Absolutely, these sort of things. That's a big part of the design yeah, okay. process. And these guys have some good, uh, a good track record in that. Huh? But we also have other architectural friends uh, who, who are, are going to be helping us in this community process to sort of uh, bring some of those sensibilities to this team as well. Uh, I think part of the thing that we really important to us is that uh, uh, you know this is going to be a unique vision to this county so it's going to make we need to make sure that our voices and the voices of people who, who live in the county and understand the county are part of this process we're not looking for some guys to fly in I always used to say buildings from outer space and there they are it's perfect see you later that's not what we're looking for here and so it's going to go slow because it's collaborative and interactive, and our sensibilities may be different than uh, plain vanilla projects, someplace else. And we're going to, um, some of these points are a key part of that community engagement process. Like, so what sort of values do we want to be grounding the whole 
idea, the, the, the site plan and the, and the housing options around, and, and certainly from our initial team, but but this is you know we're one set of ideas. We want we want the community engaged, and we want a community excitement and support for this vision. Um, but one of the things we proposed is that we're looking for as high energy efficiency as we can get to reduce monthly utility costs, because that's a key component of affordability. Um, if, if we can also actually generate some of our own energy through, through solar or other means to support this community, then we're gonna try to incorporate that. And the Energy Trust of Oregon has already signaled that they want to be a strong partner in this. Um, so that's part of it. But also thinking about, like, we don't want uh, Barry and I were just talking about some of the changes in Montana. You know, we don't want this to look like your standard cookie cutter subdivision, right? We want this to look and feel like it's from Willowa County, and it's also it's a mixture of um, house sizes and types, including single family and multifamily. But it'll be a mixture. It'll provide for different uh, different price points and different family sizes and people to move from smaller homes to bigger homes even within the same place and it will it will also be done in phases right we won't try to develop 21 acres right away we'll carve out a piece of it and get started and then expand at, um, as both the, 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 the clear demand is there and as we raise more money to keep this project going. Yeah, I think that what Mel was saying about values is really important. And in, in um, my experience with projects like this, the most important first step is a, is a values clarification conversation about what, what are important values for us as a community. And, and energy efficiency could be one. Uh, but these are not necessarily technical values. These are values about Durability, uh, access, uh, diversity. So these, that's a very important conversation to have as a bedrock for a project that's gonna go on for a few years because they become the guiding sort of dimensions for keeping on track, if you will, around what's important to people. A, a, a building project can get so complex that uh, you can lose track of that ba basic set of values and they have to be articulated carefully and thoughtfully uh, and stay present with the entire team because you know there's six seven people then there's contractors there's engineers so that that's a really important part I think of our process and, and this would fit the model of the, the LLC but on the land and the, the, the structures would be separate. it may be that in other that the, in some of these lots that we sell the land to an entity oh. uh, to build it out, or the answer is we don't know. <laughs> so, where where is the money? Did someone else have a question? Sorry. Um, um, is there a mechanism for these houses to be primary residences instead of second home residences? Yes. <laughs> so there will be, uh, and I'm still learning, and I don't know, Jeff, if you want to help me, but um, that, is there a mechanism to ensure that these are primary residences versus second second homes? And and there will be um, some sort of sort of qualification and preference um, system that. Um, that needs to be applied. As soon, as soon as we're not just talking about a pure private sector response and we begin to accept state and federal money, then there are some conditions about who, who, who these homes are available to. Uh, and there'll be a cap on your, um, you, if you exceed, for example, it's likely that if, if your household exceeds 120% of um, median area income, you would not be qualified to buy a home here, although there are exceptions to that too. Like we could carve out part of it that would just be available on the open market, a smaller subset um, of the home. So there's a lot of those issues that we still need to work through, but 
but there are mechanisms to ensure that these are for what primary <coughs> resident, residents of Willow County. And, and yeah, I, I, I guess I'd mention <coughs> conventional lenders. So some, when people buy these homes, they'll be getting could conventional you, loans yeah, from. Could you, you want to stand up and join? From um, <laughs> Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who are the primary lenders, and um, they're lending to the homeowner based on the representation that this is their primary home. So when they sign the mortgage papers, mortgage papers specifically state this is your primary home because secondary homes or vacation homes are a different type of loan product and underwriting with a great deal more risk. So the, the, the lender wants them to be a primary lender. And then al alternatively, if well, our resources, they could design um, covenants for the deed to say, uh, for the land to say, this is designed primarily for, or this is not to be used for uh, secondary or vacation homes. So there, there are ways to achieve that goal. And, and it's not just driven by the funding source. It's driven by those goals that I was talking about earlier. That, you know, it's not just what the funding constraints are, it's really what, and, and, and you build that into deeds and easements and that sort of thing. So there, there's a ton of models for that uh, out there, but uh, we're just at the beginning of, of evaluating them. I did oh. have another question. What about the money? Is it coming from grants or how, how you? Money? Uh, <laughs> so we are, yeah, no, I mean, again, I mean, Jeff might be able to chime in more too, but there's, there are, um, there, there's obviously federal funding and there's a new state, there's always been state programming, but there's a big emphasis from the governor and the legislature. They surprised a lot of people by already passing a bill early in this session to provide $200 million more for housing. Uh, there's other bills that are still working their way through legislation that uh, the legislature, including one that Commissioner Hillock has been championing on behalf of Willow County, um, that um, could provide more state funding. And then uh, Oregon Community Foundation has a special opportunity fund just in response to this challenge across Oregon around housing. Um, and, uh, and we actually did receive some funding from them that goes to some of these pre-development costs, so hiring those architects. Um, Oregon Community Foundation has supported that. And, uh, and recently, um, Jeff helped us apply to a state grant for capacity building to again, get more funding to lead towards our ability to hire some staff and also pay for more of these pre-development costs. Um, that then, you know, once we're through that, if we decide to acquire this, we're going to be looking again at federal and state sources of funding, funding towards acquisition. We'll approach foundations, we'll approach individual donors, and then we'll probably end up closing the gap with some more conventional loan um, finance. Yeah, I think the, thing, the best way to think about it is a multi-layer cake yeah. with <coughs> governmental entities, grants, individuals, employers, conventional financing, it's gonna be a multifaceted. And right now we're rounding up what we, we call capacity money, which is from governmental entities and others to just build the organization so we can hire a manager. And those in some ways are the most difficult funds to raise because we're just getting going, uh, but we've had a pretty good luck with that. But over time, and Jeff's really been helping with us because he understands the landscape of all this. It's a complicated landscape. John's involved with it. He knows how complicated it is. So there's a variety of pieces that are going to all get layered together to make it, to make it work. It's not a one thing. Uh, all the fund, funding's coming from over there. It's a multi-dimensional solution. Complex. Mm. You got one more question back there. We should keep moving. Oh, uh, Neil, so I was, yep. I was wondering, uh, I was at the planning thing last night at the city because I live in the city and own property. And everything. They, they're a little concerned about, we used to be concerned about our, our sewer effluents going into Prairie Creek in the summer. And I, it's been so busy at the head of the lake the last few years that you know the state park fills up and then we get all their influ effluence you know, around the lake into our sewer capacity. So my concern as a property owner about my taxes is, I'm all for this, I think it's great, but 
I was wondering if you could get DEQ here to give us a talk about um, possibly making, trying to find funding to, to get a few, a new couple of sewer ponds because we, we don't have enough, I know they have upgraded the sewer pond and they want to uh, make sure that they work right and all that, but we are so busy in town and in the head of the lake that the capacity we have to deal with the sewer coming from the head of the lake in the summer, those four months in the summer, put us over affluent going into Prairie Creek. They have for years. I have several letters about it from DEQ. And is there any way to find money to help us find grants to get a new sewer? It, I mean, I went to the city council and nobody there knows, oh, well, we have plenty of sewer. Well, we don't. So. So this, so we're on the front end of like exploring this, but I, but I, I appreciate I that. You, and as Nell's as, here to answer some questions. Yeah, no. I, so as Nell's mentioned, part of this first phase with the architects will include an understanding of the capacity of the existing infrastructure, the sewer and water. And uh, if it, if it's clear that improvements need to be made, yes, by all means, we're going to be pursuing that. Uh, my, my sense is, again, given the importance to the state, um, both the elected, you know, the, the, the governor's office and the legislature, um, they also understand the importance of infrastructure to meet this housing need. And so there are going to be avenues with the EQ to, to address those issues. But I don't know them all right now. But it, it's certainly on our radar. And I, well, no one seems to know how much capacity we have because we have several developments going in here and several proposed out there. And uh, when they tried to put the urban growth boundary in and Krieger tried to put 70 units up there, we didn't have capacity then. And, so, um, so part so of this effort is going to have to be a careful assessment of the impact on the capacity. Well, it's and so much the assessment, we need money. Okay. Well, so, so the first thing for us is the assessment so that we can understand what the needs are. And then if we do need money, then yeah, we, we will help work with the city to pursue that. I'm concerned that the uh, that there's money for architects, but it sounds like a lot of the data gathering, a lot of the nonprofit building of what data, what pers how many units would be needed to solve the problems in the county, and that's a that's a really interesting basic data question that is way before architects come in. And uh, so that so I could that's where we were talking about before the housing needs assessment, right? and, and we have been working with the county and DLCD to try to go that next phase beyond just the city's look to look at a countywide look. Uh, but that's also leading to. Um, to why we think this is best approached in phases, because we think if, for example, we did one development that was 10 or 15 homes, that there's probably demand for that, that if we hit the price point right, if we hit that affordability <coughs> price point right, that anecdotally, we just believe there's demand for that. But we would agree that we need to have a better fix on that, and that's part, part of our to-do list. And, that, that, and part of why we're talking about three to five years is these things are going to take time. We have to get that assessment. We've got to find the money. We've got to build the infrastructure. It isn't a fast train. Uh, it's got to be done well. The planning's got to be thorough. The data's got to be collected. Uh, and, and so that's one of the reasons that the next project, I think, is important yeah, to us. We should go to the next one. And we should acknowledge that the uh, proponents back there <laughs> Ralph Swaggart, <laughs> and um, and I mean I should really let Ralph tell the, most of the story, but um, Ralph stepped up uh, and is the owner of a really important building in, in, a, in a building on the National Historic Register in downtown Enterprise, and he and Janet have been working together uh, to uh, improve the building and to ensure that the 27 apartments and six commercial spaces are available and affordable to people in this community. Uh, and, and they're some of the most affordable homes in Enterprise. Uh, and they would like to ensure 
that that continues um, in the future. So they asked us to explore whether or not um, this was an opportunity through this new Working Homes LLC uh, to acquire this building and continue that tradition uh, and, and legacy that they have built. Um, so we are exploring that with them um, to see whether or not uh, that's an opportunity for us. And, and our goal would be, first and foremost, to ensure that this building isn't um, pursued by developers that want to upgrade it or turn it into vacation rentals or something else that we can continue to meet the needs within our own community uh, for the long term. And um, again, as having a nonprofit base, whether we could attract some additional money that would help do some improvements uh, to heating and energy conservation that would reduce uh, monthly utility costs and again, continue to contribute to high quality space and affordability uh, for the people that are there. And our intention um, is uh, just to continue the, 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 the current occupancy that is there. So um, everybody that is a tenant and in good standing with Ralph and Janet, we would, would transition if, if we decide to move forward with this acquisition. Uh, and then we would work with them uh, on a plan and as we had capital available to continue to improve the building where we could and also maintaining it within the requirements of the National Historic Building Standards. And I would just add, and I think it's important uh, to, to echo what Neil said, because uh, Ralph and Janet's uh, involvement in this is one of the first examples of how it's going to take all of us to solve the problem. And they're, they're willing us to step up and, and work with us on this and be part of this is uh, an important example and one that I'm very grateful for, uh, because I think that uh, when you're looking at a project like for land, it's going to take time to be able to, to, to also be uh, maintaining the kind of housing that we think is important in this effort right now, today, uh, is very important. So thanks again to Ralph and Janet to help make that happen. Are there other buildings? Could this be an example? Are there other places in the county that could emulate this? Yeah, so I mean, that's, we kind of stuck this down here that, that um, you know, these are the first two opportunities that the individuals in the community, when they either, either even before they knew we were creating Working Homes LLC or subsequent to hearing word of that, they have asked us to whether or not this would be worth exploring. And they both seemed like great opportunities. And as Nels represented, and, and I think Nels was really instrumental in helping us think about you know, one's a, a shorter term opportunity to maintain housing that's already meeting our goal. And another one is a longer term opportunity to create more housing stock to meet that goal. And, and we're gonna continue to look for other opportunities, both in existing buildings or other parcels that could be developed. Uh, and we know there's a need in the lower <laughs> valley and, and, and where there's um, opportunities and partners down there, we would try to do that. Obviously, we need to build capacity, so we've got to be careful about not over committing to too many projects right out of the gate. But our, our vision would be to be you know, working wherever the needs are across the county. Uh, so it's not a one direction, one new development or building. Um, I'm just kind of curious. I'm sitting here thinking oh, about sorry. there's, um, I look around myself, I look at people who are in my peer group, and there are a large number of us that are in a little bit, we're in nicer homes, but still sort of within that window of affordability you're describing, and we may be single, and we are older. Oh, well, we are. Is there, are, do you see as a potential strategy finding some way to provide some form of senior housing or smaller community housing for that group to then vacate, you know, make available this right. group of homes that may have one person in them? Right. Yeah, we are. 
Good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The, the cottage concept kind of fits well with that, where yes. um, you would, you know, you have all this land. This is a big piece of land. A part of it could be a 10 unit, 15 unit cottage complex, mm -hmm. which um, suits seniors or retirees very, very well. Um, story, story and a half to what is exactly what public policy advocates have recommended, which is exactly what you're suggesting, which is uh, making the other housing available. Mm -hmm. so. Great. I but I don't think we need to be dependent on this parcel. I think there right. are lots of other parcels mm -hmm. uh, that could meet that objective, which I, I think fits under uh, the objectives of yeah. <coughs> leadership. No, well, I wasn't sure if you wanted me to go back. No. That <laughs> <laughs> signals were short. I thought he wanted me to steal something from him. <laughs> but we're probably out of time, right? Well, Barry, here we go. But no, those are questions. Do so we have time? So we're open for questions. Now Barry was first, and then Lori, and then Roger. Um, since, you, since this being sold is a project for working people, because the employers here can't find people to, to places to live, it would seem to me that if you're going to build something for older people, that should be a separate project, and maybe this ought to be restricted to people who are working in the county. Is there any going to be any problem with that, or is, it, I mean, the Wallala Resources, your mission, I think, started out as to improve working conditions or whatever it was you said and this is billed as for to provide housing for working people so that business can thrive here. Um, what are the chances of that happening to where it's restricted or limited to people who are working? Uh, is there any chance of that? <laughs> no, yeah, so, so, so I, I mean, we're, I'm only being careful just because we're still in the early, okay. uh, sort of the early stage of this process. Um, I, I think it's fair to say, and I've got two board members here if they want to speak up, that um, the primary goal, and even Nancy was speaking to it, the primary goal yeah. is okay. to provide good quality, affordable housing to people that live here and work here. But there's a lot of different ways to do that, right? And, and so one was maintaining existing housing stock so it doesn't get moved into another market. One is building new housing stock specifically for that. And then Nancy offered a third option, which is if a current home is really bigger than a person who's no longer working needs, if, a, if there was a nice place for them to move so that that could then be made available to a family that lives and works here, right? And so we gotta work through all of that. And I think we wanna be open-minded about all the solutions that are possible to meet this. But the clear goal is to provide homes for that demographic that we lost after the mill shut down, right? So okay. the working families that moved away. I think also, and you know, I, I can speak a little bit uh, looser about this perhaps than Nils, but <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I think that what's important is the fabric of the community. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so we're not limited to this parcel that might end up being only for people who work in, in, in the county, but there are, other, there are other kinds of solutions to meet our bigger objectives around the fabric of the community. So, I, you know, if we're seeing people that have been an important part of our community that want to stay here, can't afford to be here, or don't want the house housing that they have now, and can see options to that. I think that's something that we can and should be exploring uh, on this list of possibilities. And so, so I am aware of one of those policies already that we're kind of brains that I've been brainstorming about to meet that need. Uh, but I see that falling under the the umbrella of what we're trying to do because I'm thinking about the fabric of the community not ignoring the working part that we that, that started this conversation, uh, uh, but not limiting ourselves to just that. Uh, I don't know if that's helpful. Lori? That was part of my question, so. Okay, okay. thanks. And then Roger and then. <laughs> this, this has been an excellent presentation. I really appreciate it. And 
It's got me going on all kinds of ideas. I have way too many questions to ask in this setting. <laughs> so my question is, where, how can uh, folks that are here in this room or others on Zoom can, you know, meet with somebody or talk to somebody or come to the next meeting or whatever? Okay. What, so um, yeah. we we did have kind of a soft launch on a website. Um, and it is, right now, it's just a kind of a, a landing page, but we will be building that out and providing more information there. In the short term, um, you're going back to the list of people involved in the organization here. You can approach uh, myself or anybody on the advisory committee, or if you would like to approach Jeff to any of the people that you know there, uh, we are meeting regularly to be thinking about this and planning our next steps. And, and then we will be having a series of public meetings with, that, with Scott Edwards Architects. That will be specific to that 21 acre parcel, so it won't be sort of a bigger open discussion about all the different opportunities in the county. But those are sort of the most immediate ways to engage with us. Okay. <laughs> along the same lines. Yep. I keep this yep. I just wanted to mention about the um, issue of prefer giving preference. Uh, giving, pref giving preference is compl a complicated issue because of, of fair housing. The 1968 Fair Housing Act, which came out of the old Civil Rights Act, um, was you can't give preferences, or really you can't discriminate mm -hmm. with housing. That's been extended to say that you really have to be careful about any preferences you give. So that's led to some problems when you're trying to address specific populations. And so in Bend, where workforce housing is also a, a you know, serious problem, um, uh, they've asked for an exception from HUD for fair housing where they can, employers can sponsor applicants to buy homes and they can sponsor them like with saying, okay, I'm willing to put up 20,000 or 10,000, depending on the size of the business, for my employees to get preference for this housing. And the HUD has now created a pilot program to allow those preferences to encourage workforce housing because workforce housing wasn't the issue of the day in 1968 so, or 70. A follow-up on that, Jeff. Um, I was talking to a guy at Anderson Perry, an engineer, and he used to work in Hawaii, and he said second homes are taxed at an extremely high amount just to tamp that down because there was no workforce housing. Is the state able to do something like that, or there's a, or, or some of the zoning or the tax? Yes, yeah, I, I don't believe. Yeah, state, um, the state, uh, you know, the Oregon Code uh, doesn't allow for that. You'd have to be enabling legislation to do that. Right. And um, that's an interesting idea. I mean, as folks who were trying to figure out how to crack this nut of making, um, you know, mitigating the, the, the factors that are creating housing uh, uh, scarcity. Yeah, I assume we're not reinventing the wheel. This is no, down I mean, all these towns from Barcelona Van, to the city of Vancouver did this uh, in yeah. D.C., which was they put a tax on um, all of the foreigners uh, who were coming in to mm -hmm. double up housing and making Vancouver housing extraordinarily expensive. So um, that's Canada, but um, um, it's, you know, Hawaii is a different, it's an island culture, and so the land use is completely different than most of the continent. Um, uh, the, the same, I, in the, uh, I, I, when I was, I think a junior or senior in, in college, I, served on the state of Massachusetts um, Western Open Lands Planning Commission. And it was the same issue there. Um, a lot of developers were buying small farms. Uh, farmers were able to sell their land uh, at a very high price and buy three times as much acreage in upstate New York. And the state was concerned about the loss of sort of the agrarian uh, landscape, culture, contribution to the community. Um, so they did two things. One, they changed the tax on second homes, and then even if you were a primary owner, if you made, like if you demoed the house and built the mega mansion, they put you in a much higher tax category too. 
I can see. Take one more here, Nils. Okay. Five to you. This is all the, a fabulous, and then I'm on the Planning Commission, so I look forward to working with you uh, about that. But I can see the need for the high density tourist places, so like we're surrounded, half the houses around us are used a few months of the year. So if they could buy at a high density, then they wouldn't have to worry about yard work, et cetera, and it would open up those houses around us for people who, for working houses. So. I, you know, I can see the need for that kind of development somewhere in the community so that we could get some of our houses back. Yeah, yeah. I think this kind of thinking that goes beyond this parcel is really important because there's a lot of parcels and, and a lot of opportunities. And so uh, thinking about it more broadly is going to be part of the, part of the solution. I'm not sure we can wait for the state to change the tax. No, I don't think we can. <laughs> and, uh, isn't it like 40% of houses are people's second homes? 30 anyway. It's in 30? County, so, and a lot of them are empty yeah. most of the year. Our neighborhood is, yeah, it's it's empty. Empty. I wish we could change that. It would make a huge difference. Yeah. You're, you're, you're talking a bit making Americans immobile. They don't like it. Uh, thank, thank you very much, folks. By the way, I keep forgetting to tell people that you can, uh, we don't charge for these Tuesday talks, but if you want to throw a buck or two in the, in the deal to buy the cookies and do all that stuff, it will be appreciated. And Nels and Nils, thank you for the... <laughs>